Happy Tuesday, everybody, and thank you for coming back and joining me tonight here on Next on the T. I'm your host, Chris Mascaro, and tonight we've got two more great guests that I'm really looking forward to sharing with you over the next hour. First up with me tonight, I'm going to be joined by a guy that Golf Digest has named the best instructor in the state of Texas every year since 2011, and that's Tim Cusick. Tim worked with Hank Haney at the Hank Haney School of Golf for 23 years. He's now the Director of Instruction for the Four Seasons Hotels and Resorts. He's also the author of the book, The Four Keys to Improve Your Game, which you can find out online at Amazon.com. Among Tim's students are guys like Bruce Crampton, who had great success out on the PGA Tour and the Champions Tour as well. He's also worked with one of my favorites on the LPGA Tour, and that's Sandra Palmer. So we have a lot to get into with Tim when he joins me here in just a few minutes. Following him, I'm going to get a visit from the 1992 PGA Tour Rookie of the Year and now one of the best broadcasters in any sport anywhere on TV or radio, and that's Mark Carnivale. Mark was a great player going all the way back to his high school and college days. He played his college golf at James Madison University, won a couple of times when he was there, was the team MVP a couple of times, and he was so good that he was inducted into their uh, Athletics Hall of Fame back in 2009. He won once on the what was then the Nike Tour and once out on the PGA Tour at the 1992 Chattanooga Classic. We'll talk about some of his victories, plus the work he's doing now as a broadcaster for uh, Sirius X- XM's PGA Tour channel and over on uh, PGA Tour Live as well. Mark will be along with me a little bit later on in this half hour. So, folks, more great stories coming your way tonight on this edition of Next on the Tee. Thank you so much for tuning in and taking the journey with me over the next hour. And as you know, we are sponsored by the French Lick Resort. Let's hear a word from our good friend Steve Rondonero about what they've got going on up there. When planning your next golf buddy trip, consider something completely different for 2018 at French Lick Resort. The Eagles, Birdies, and Pigeons Package. That's right, Pigeons. Take your best shot with a day at our Pete Dye course, a day at our Donald Ross course, then top it off with an outing at our new Sporting Clay shooting range. This package is reserved for groups of 12 or more. Just you and a pal craving a world-class golf getaway? Well, our Hall of Fame package can't be beat for a pure golf experience and value. Pete Dye, Donald Ross, and our two historic hotels make a legendary combination. French Lick Resort can also help you bring your game to the next level. Check out our Early Birdies Tune-Up, our Game Changer, and Rapid Recovery Golf Academies. Start making those 2018 plans now with an online visit to FrenchLick.com. French Lick Resort, home of the 2018 Senior LPGA Championship and the Symmetra Tour Donald Ross Classic. Yeah, folks, be sure to go online to FrenchLick.com to see for yourself how great a place it really is and to book your stay as well. And, folks, you've heard me talking about Club Hub Sensors over the last several months, and it is the best portable shot tracking and swing analysis golf device out on the market. Other shot trackers tell you what happened. Club Hub tells you what happened and why. Take the progress that you make on the practice tee directly to your rounds with the only device of its kind that can go on the course with you. I have club hub sensors on all of my clubs. They screw right into the tops of your grips, and I can tell you, since I put on the club hub sensors on my clubs, I've learned more about my swing and all of the data surrounding it than I've learned over the 40 years I've been playing golf. Not only do you get GPS distances to the hazards and to the green, but after your round, you can look back at the images and the layout of every hole of the course you just played and see exactly where and how far you hit every shot. No other GPS tool on the market captures that and lets you go back and review your round the way the Club Hub app does. It's available for Android or iPhones. The app keeps track of your swing speed of every club in your bag, your tempo, angle of attack, plus you get a 3D view of your swing as well. And no other rangefinder can do all of that for you. Go over to clubhubgolf.com and order your set of Club Hub sensors today and, and enter the coupon code NEXT, that's N-E-X-T, to get 10% off all products at checkout. Again, clubhubgolf.com, enter the coupon code NEXT, and you're going to get the best GPS swing and analysis tool on the market for a great low price, and you're going to see your game in a whole new way. We're also excited to be partnering with the Ben Hogan Golf Equipment Company. They are back with the same great equipment that you know and love without the retail markup that you hate. Now you can buy premium Ben Hogan irons, wedges, utility irons, hybrids, and bags directly from the factory at prices your wallet is really going to appreciate. Visit them online at benhogangolf.com or give them a call at 844-53-HOGAN. That's 844 844- 
534-6426 to learn more and order your set today. Please also check out our friends over at the Bobby Jones Apparel Company by going online to bobbyjones.com. The early spring collection has arrived. The shift in seasons is an opportunity to change things up layer upon layer. They've added some great new details, fresh colors, new additions with genuine enduring character. See the early spring collection by going online to bobbyjones.com. And folks, as you also know, we are partnering with Russ Holden and the folks over at Caddy for a Cure. One of the most unique opportunities in the world of professional golf is available to you through Caddy for a Cure. Spend a day inside the ropes with one of the world's best players as their caddy. It's a fantastic way to have the time of your life while supporting our wounded service members and Fanconi Anemia. You're going to get to walk side-by-side side with your tour player, experiencing professional golf as an insider. In addition to this amazing experience, you're going to receive a fantastic gift package from Caddy for a Cure, which includes Under Armour logo apparel and an eyewear package, a tour-grade caddy bib suitable for autographs and framing, a tin cup ball marking gift, chef's cut real jerky, and professional photographs of your day. For more information, go online to Caddy for a Cure, that's C-A-D-D-Y-F-O-R-A-C-U-R-E, caddyforacure.com to learn more. All right, now joining me on the French Lick Resort guest line is one of the most decorated instructors in the state of Texas, and that's Tim Cusick. Let me give you some background on Tim. He's been a member of the PGA of America since 1989. He's been named the best teacher in the state of Texas by Golf Digest every year since 2011. He's also been named top teacher in the South Central region by Golf Magazine, best public facilities teacher by Avid Golf Magazine, top 10 in Dallas by Lessons.com, and he's a three-time winner of the Northern Texas PGA's Teacher of the Year Award. He's also won the Northern Texas PGA's Horton Smith Award, which is given annually for outstanding and continuing contributions to the professional golf education. Tim was coached and helped, I should say, helped coach more than 150 junior players and helped them secure golf scholarships. He's also coached players like Bruce Crampton, Brad Elder, Hollis Stacy, and Sandra Palmer. He formerly managed and taught at the Hank Haney Golf School and worked with Hank Haney for 23 years. He's currently the Director of Instruction at the Four Seasons Hotels and Resorts and author of the book, The Four Keys to Improve Your Game, which you can find out on Amazon.com. And I'm honored to have him with me tonight here on Next on the Tee. Hey, Tim, thanks for coming on the show. Wow, Chris, thanks for the great introduction. That, that's so nice of you. <laughs> Absolutely. You're welcome. So, Tim, I want to start our time tonight by talking about your passion for the game of golf. And, you know, first, let's go all the way back. When did you first fall in love with the game? Wow. I, I remember my first uh, recollection. I was uh, I lived in Erie, Pennsylvania for the first few years of my life. And I remember my father and I going to a, a, a little field or park uh, when I was probably five years old and, and just, you know, whacking the ball around a little bit. And Tim, as, as I mentioned in your intro, you're now one of the most decorated teachers, you know, anywhere in the country. And, and I'm curious, you know, what fuels you every day to go out and meet with one of your students or a new student and, you know, give the same lesson that you've probably given hundreds of times to other students? What gets you still excited about being a teacher of the game? You know, that's a, that's a great question because I, I get that asked uh, often from uh, from other students or, or just members at the club or, or friends. And I, I, I'm one of the few, I, I believe that uh, truly do every day what I love to do. I have a passion for it. And that's, you know, teaching the game of golf and I do it all day long. I do it with my, uh, with my 15 year old son. I do it, you know, with friends in the neighborhood. It never, uh, never stops. I'm, I'm sitting here talking to you and I've got the golf channel on watching the golf channel. So it's, uh, it's just, you know, it's a passion of mine and, and I, I've always loved sports. I've always loved the coaching aspect and, uh, you know, and, and golf just happens to be my, uh, my flavor, I guess. So with all the lessons and all the things that you're doing, whether it's for, you know, your students, you know, out with your son, all of those sorts of things, do you ever get an opportunity to spend any time on your own game? I do. You know, I, I'm kind of a, a closet practicer, I would, I would say. I, uh, I putt a lot at the house uh, at, at nighttime. We've got, a, we've got a mat in the house. We've got a little uh, hitting cage in the garage that I'll go in every once in a while. I, uh, I get out and hit a few balls 
here and there. And, and I've, you know, I, I love going out and playing golf with my son. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the special things that uh, any father could ever do with his, with his son. And I love the game. I love to play it. I just, you know, I've got to take care of my business first and my, my students. And, you know, I might go three or four weeks and, and maybe just play once or twice. And then I might play three or four times in the next five days. So it just kind of ebbs and flows. And Tim, let's talk about your teaching philosophy. When, when you meet with a student for the first time, you know, how do you zero in on, on where they need help and, and what, what's, what's your approach? Talk about your teaching philosophy and how you help a brand new student. So Chris, I look at, I look at, uh, um, golfers in, in really two different categories. There's a category where uh, it's a it's a newbie a new uh, student or they don't have the golf ball up in the air, so to speak. Uh, and that person I need to really develop a swing motion. I need to get them to learn how to swing the golf club and then be able to find the ground and then uh, you know help them get the ball up in the air. And then most of my lessons obviously are, are with you know more accomplished uh, golfers or or you know, people that have the ball up in the air. And once you have the golf ball up in the air, to me, from that point until you, you know, you're teaching a tour player, and that's a big gap in between, uh, I look at four things before I really pay attention to the golf swing. And I'm looking at, uh, I'm looking at the, the trajectory of the shot. You know, the ball's either going to fly the height I think it should fly with the club they have based on their club head speed, or it's going to fly higher, it's going to fly lower. I'm looking at the curvature of the golf ball. I'm looking at, at where the ball's hitting on the club face, the face contact, and then, you know, maybe most important, I'm looking at what happens when they, they, uh, they create impact. And, and impact to me is, is super important when the ball is on the ground because you have to be so precise in hitting the ball on the ground at the same time or at least hitting the ground first and then the ball. So those four things kind of lead me into where I would start my diagnosis and uh, and you and I both know you can only give a, a student a couple things, and that's about it. So I've got to make sure what I give them is going to make a difference. So Tim, it sounds like to me you're more old school. You're you're uh, you know what your eyes tell you versus maybe a, a TrackMan guy with the with all the data and the, the smash factors and and all of those sort of, sorts of things. Is that accurate? Well, I mean, that's, uh, you know, you have these categories now, old school and new school and technology savvy. And uh, I would say that I'm uh, I'm very well versed in whatever you might uh, consider old school. And uh, I'm, I'm very proficient in the new school ways. I, I uh, have access to a track man. I don't use it for every lesson. Um, I, I, uh, I would view track man kind of like, and, and all the new technology that, that's out there in the last five, six, seven years, is kind of like what video analysis was for the instructor back in the late 80s, early 90s. And, and you had, you had all, and I'm, I'm dating myself now, but you had all these ideas <laughs> of what you thought was happening, and then all of a sudden when you were able to see it, now you're either confirming or learning, you know, about re- really what was happening. And I think the same is true now. That's happening with the, you know, with the the ground forces and the, the body tracks and the track mans and the flight scopes that are that are out there. But I would I would say that I can I can be very very proficient in in uh, helping anyone's golf swing, tour player all the way down to you know someone that shoots a hundred. As long as I have a golf ball, we have an area to hit, and uh, and I have a student. Tim's talking about your students. Let's let's talk about a couple of the more famous ones. Bruce Crampton was somebody that leaped off the page or left off the page when uh, I was reading through, you know, your bio and, and folks that you're working with. He's a guy who won 44 times between the PGA Tour and the Champions Tour, finished second four times in a major. Talk about what it's like when you're trying to work with a guy like Bruce Crampton. You know, I was I was fortunate to meet Bruce. I was at the time I was working at uh, PJ West in the uh, in the late '80s, early '90s, and Bruce had a, a winter home there and and would would practice there, getting ready for the the Champions Tour, uh, starting each and every year. And I just I befriended him um, at the time. You know, I was I was under the tutelage of of Hank Haney in terms of my teaching, and Hank had helped Bruce a little bit. 
and uh, Bruce kind of gravitated, you know, towards me because I was available every day at PJ West. And we just, we kind of struck up a friendship and, and uh, I would say that, um, you know, I learned as much, if not more from Bruce than, than he certainly learned from me. He was, he was a, a, a student that required um, the utmost uh, precision and expertise. And, and well, he, he required that of himself and obviously anyone that was around him. He was very, very generous to me and very nice to me. And uh, I'll tell you, you know, he wasn't the most powerful guy on tour, but the sound that came off his club face when he hit the golf ball, I, I, I've never heard uh, a, a sweeter sound in my life. I imagine, you know, when you, you talk about striking up a friendship, when you're when you're working together or, you know, maybe in some downtime, he's had to have some great stories. Is there a, is there a story that, that you could share about, uh, you know, his experience being out on tour? You know, he was he was really he was one of the greatest storytellers you, you could ever be around. He, he was a very funny man. In his uh, pro am groups, I mean, he probably told a, a joke every three holes. But I, I do remember, you know, one time we were out of PJ West and and uh, we we're on the stadium golf course, and the third hole is a is a, a long, it was a long par four with a, a big huge bunker on the left hand side, uh, in the landing area for the for the tee shot, and he happened to hit one in there one day when I was when I was watching him play on the course and he went in there. And he had 225, 230, whatever it was at the time. And he went in there with a fairway wood. And I'm, I'm the, the lip of the bunker, he wasn't right next to it. He was in the middle of the bunker. But the lip of the bunker had to be four or five feet high. And I'm just thinking to myself, he's got a good lie. And I didn't say a word. I'm just thinking to myself, man, I can't wait to see this shot. And he hit this shot. He barely moved the sand. I mean, barely, Chris, move the sand, hits this beautiful draw up on the green, maybe, you know, 20, 25 feet away. And I, and I said to him, I said, Bruce, I said, I said, what did you do different in that bunker to hit that shot? And he looked at me and he had this inquisitive look on his face and he said, why would I do anything different? It's just a shot like it would be off the fairway. And it just, it just, it hit me like a ton of bricks that when you're that solid with your balance and your pivot, and the angle of your swing, it doesn't matter where the ball is. As long as you get the club back down to the ground and the ball at the same time, it doesn't matter if it's sand or gravel or a cart path or grass. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, that had to be an amazing shot. Holy <laughs> smoke. I, st- I can still see the shot. That was This was probably 1990, I'm going to say. So, I mean – what was that? Twenty-eight years ago. You know, I still see the shot in my in my in my mind's eye. You know, when I when I tell that story. How about oh, let's move over on the lady side? Sandra Palmer, one of my favorite players uh, back in the day, out on the LPGA tour. You know, wh- when did you start working with her? You know, so so at PJ West, uh, you had a lot of tour players female and male that, that, uh, you know, would hang out there in the wintertime in Palm Springs. The weather's perfect. And, uh, you know, the tour tends to go through the, the, the West coast on whether it's the LPGA, the champions tour, the PGA tour. And so, uh, Sandra was, uh, you know, a student of Harvey Penix growing up and, and, and Ernie Vossler, who was uh, a partner with landmark land. Keith hotel used to, to help Sandra. And so Sandra would come over and, and take lessons from me every once in a while um, and so Sandra and Hollis Stacy and Chris Cheddar, uh, Melissa McNamara were all girls that, uh, or ladies that I used to watch, uh, in the late eighties, early nineties at PJ West. And, and Sandra was, you know, she was, I don't think she's ever had a bad day in her life. She was always up. She was always, you know, fiery and, and, you know, had a smile on her face and, and she would always relate back to whatever I would tell her. She would always, always relate it back to somehow, some way. You know, Harvey Pennick had said the same thing to her, you know, X number of years beforehand. And, you know, maybe I said it a little bit different than Harvey. Maybe Harvey said it a little bit different than than, uh, than I did. But it, it was nice to hear that I was somewhere close to being on the same page as one of the greatest instructors, in, you know, that we've ever known. And, and to that end, 
Tim, you know, he, Mr. Penick was obviously, you know, what a fabulous instructor and a legend down there, you know, in in the state of Texas. Do you ever get the opportunity to talk with him or or, or be around him? You know, I I never I never uh I never saw him in person. I never saw him speak in person. Uh obviously not not teach. You know, I had I did have the opportunity a couple times with uh, with Chris Cheddar uh, to to meet Ben Hogan. I actually saw him hit a shot too. I saw wow. him hit a shot. We were one time I was I was visiting Chris in Fort Worth, and uh, we went over to Shady Oaks, and she was a very good friend of, of Ben Hogan's from uh, her time at at uh, TCU when she played college golf there. And and so and and, and Mr. Hogan would watch her and, and help her with her game, and so. We were out there one one July afternoon, and and he came walking out, and his you know he had his suit on and his tie, and and uh, you know came out on the on the little nine where we were hitting balls, and and you know Chris was having Mr. Hogan watch uh, watch her hit a few shots, and and I jumped in a golf cart with her brother, and we went out you know so they could be alone uh, at one of the holes, but we were only about probably seventy yards away or so. And she kept prodding him because I, she knew that we were watching. And she kept prodding him, you know, show me, Mr. Hogan, show me. And he grabbed the club from her, and you know, he kind of stepped in. So I had the angle kind of from side on, where I could see his grip and his in his setup that way, and see the golf ball. He stepped in there, and he had that, you know, that 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 front foot, his his left foot kicked out. And he waggled a couple times, and now he's got a tie on. He's got you know a dress shirt. He's got dress shoes, and it's you know 98 degrees in the middle of July. And he waggles it a couple of times and, and, you know, knocks the seven iron out there and hands the club back to Chris and probably said something like, you know, that's the way it's done. And, but I mean, that picture too is, you know, that is right in the middle of my, my brain and never will go away to, uh, to have an opportunity to, to meet him and, and also to see him hit a golf shot. Wow. What a fantastic memory. Good for you. And, and Tim, you, you mentioned, you know, all the years that, that you worked with, with Hank Haney. We, you know, talk about your time with Hank and uh, you know the opportunity to to learn under his tutelage. You know, Hank and I met at uh, at Pinehurst Hotel and Country Club in uh, in 1983. They had a, a program uh, there that they had just started the year before that was called a golf internship, and they took nine aspiring young professionals, and you worked in a different part of the operation every month for nine months from March until uh, Thanksgiving. And Hank was was running the golf schools. He was a young, you know, up and coming instructor, still in his twenties. He and another guy named Mike LeBeau, who's a, a very well known instructor uh, in Phoenix. And uh, Mike's uh, wife Sandy obviously was there, and, and she's a very well known instructor. And Sandy's father is Jack Lumpkin. And so that whole uh, group was was at uh, Pinehurst when I first was there as a twenty one year old, twenty years old, twenty years old, twenty one years old. And, uh, you know, I just, I kind of gravitated towards them. I would just sit behind all those instructors and just watch them teach hour after hour after hour after hour. And I, at, at first I really didn't know, you know, what I was watching and we didn't have any long conversations. I just watched them and, you know, I kind of started, you know, getting an idea of, of you know, what they look for and how they taught. And, and, uh, I went to, to work for Jack the next summer up in, in the mountains of North Carolina at the Elk River Club. And, and then for Mike in, in Phoenix for a couple of years at uh, Alta Mesa Country Club. And then Hank called and said there was an opening at PGA West. And I went to PGA West and, and stayed there for six years and then moved to Dallas when uh, when he uh, opened up his, his teaching facility, the Hank Haney Golf Ranch, and uh, taught with him. I was his director of instruction for all the pro- all the properties that we had in Dallas. We had about 30 instructors at, at one time teaching at all these different uh all these different uh, facilities, and I taught with him there for 13 years, and and we also coached the SMU golf team for for four or five years in the early middle, middle 90s. So, was there something that you know, Hank's style or his way of teaching that rubbed off on you? Is there something that you took from watching him teach uh, other folks? Yeah, I would just say, and, and the same with Mike, and the same with Jack, but I would just say they got results very quickly. Uh, you know, it it, it didn't. It wasn't, you know, it was going to take two or three lessons or you got to go hit a thousand balls or whatever. I mean, they got results within the time that the lesson was being taught. 
and there was a difference. There was improvement, and there was improvement every time. It wasn't just you know hit and miss. And so I, I knew there had to be had to be something there. I didn't really have a a, a lot of formal training as a, as a junior golfer for instruction. So my mind was open to, to really to anything. And I just happened to, you know, happen to stumble upon, be very fortunate to, to, you know, be around those three instructors. And, and then, you know, uh, you know, more specifically Hank for, for 23 years. And it just, you know, I, I couldn't have had a better training. I mean, it was my master's, my PhD, my, whatever you want to call it, but, you know, you put your 10,000 hours and I can promise you, you know, I put that much time in just watching him teach and watching Mike and watching Jack Lumpkin teach and, 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 you know, most of the time Hank, but, um, you know, it just, it, it, it all made sense to me and it just kept making more sense and more sense. And then I started to get good results. And as I got good results, my players started playing better. And, and when I was at the Hank Caney golf ranch, I really started gravitating towards teaching a lot of competitive juniors um, in the Dallas area and, and around the, the surrounding area. And people would come from, you know, really all over the United States to, to come and take lessons from us. And then when I moved to, to the Four Seasons, you know, I, I kind of was running my own show and, and you know, still had the, the success with the juniors and our juniors at our club. Um, you know, we've got one of the best, if not the best, you know, junior programs at a, at a private club in, in, uh, in the city of Dallas. And, uh, I, I love helping the kids because the kids, the kids are great listeners and, you know, they, they want to learn and the parents will do anything for the kids. And, you know, when you take a kid that, you know, it, it just happened over and over again, you know, we had a, a young junior at our club, uh, Anthony Pellucci, who, uh, I ended up, you know, teaching for a number of years and, he was a number one junior in the country. He was a, a rival of Jordan Spieth, and uh, Anthony was junior player of the year one year, and Jordan was the next, and moved on to USC and is now a pro. And and, uh, and then a couple of years later, there was a kid named Matt Gilcrest who I started teaching when he was ten years old, and he ended up being the number two junior in the country. And just you know, those types of of transformations in students' game, you know, catch other people's eye, and so. It's the greatest form of, of communication that you could have is your student playing well and, and telling the next person, uh, you know, how they did it. Tim, just a couple more before we let you go. i got to get a lesson from you. So uh, I'm Certainly. curious, and I looked at a lot of the videos that you've got, and you've got a ton of, the, ton of videos on your site, timcusick.com, and, and uh, out on, uh, out on uh, YouTube as well. But give us one. Uh, how can we determine – if we're swinging on the right swing pan, uh, swing plane? Well, you know, the first thing, Chris, that'll, that'll determine is just, you know, how your impact is. You know, if you can hit the ball on the ground at the same time when the ball's on the ground, you're probably very close to being on a, on a, on a good plane. But, you know, if you're not, pay attention to, to, to where the ball's hitting on the face. If you're hitting on the toe, you know, there's a chance that you might be a little bit too upright. And if you're hitting on the heel, there's a chance you might be a little bit too flat. And if you have trouble getting down to the ground, there's probably a good chance you're too flat. And if you're digging up the ground too much, you're probably too upright. So those things are very telltale signs that, uh, you know, will, will, will help you figure out, you know, are you on the plane? Are you above it? Are you below it? If you're, if you're above it and you're digging the ground up and you're hitting off the toe and popping the ball up, make some baseball swings. Hold the club up at knee level and practice some swings that, that envisions the ball at knee level, and that will round your golf swing out. And if you're having trouble getting down to the ground, get the club to swing a little more up over your shoulder, going back, and a little more up over your shoulder coming through. And those will be some some easy things that you can do to get the club on a better plane. Tim, talk about your book, The Four Keys to Improve uh, to Improve Your Game, available out on uh, Amazon.com. So I, I, I wrote that book uh, back in 2012, 2013. I started it, and it was kind of at the assist, insistence of uh, – of one of my students, Deb Melke, who uh, is actually the last chapter of the book. And, you know, she kept prod me and she always has been prod me about, um, she helps me with my website. She helps me with my, my social media. And, and she, she was a student that, you know, was a, a 90 shooter that had the goal of trying to, to qualify for the USGA senior amateur when she turned 50. And, and lo and behold, she did that and qualified for a number of uh, US mid-ams and, won a bunch of tournaments and she's the last chapter of my book. And, 
And the book really talks about, you know, the four keys, impact, face contact, curvature, and trajectory, and how important those are, and then some practice and playing skills and how to play the game better and some short game, and there's some great stories in there along the way. And it's a, it's a good, easy read, and I think it will help any golfer that wants to improve. Tim, your website is timcusickgolf.com. Let our listeners know what uh, what they'll find on your website and how they can follow you on social media as well. Well, my website is just really a, a culmination of, of what I've done in my career. I've got probably 75 or so videos on, on it uh, from YouTube. My YouTube is my YouTube channel is Tim Cusick Golf. Uh, my Twitter handle is Tim Cusick Golf and Facebook as well. And and uh, Instagram too. And I, I, I constantly am posting on all those social media outlets and love to talk to my students about that. All that is, is just offering advice and, and things that have, have helped students over the year. I, I, I have, uh, you know, I've got stories on my website. I've got, uh, you know, my instruction uh, menu, my two and three day golf retreats that I, that I do at the four seasons in Dallas. It's a great, you know, Four, uh, four Diamond Hotel that's 15 minutes from the airport, and we hosted the Byron Nelson, the 18 team Byron Nelson, for 35 years, and it just it just moved over to a, a new golf course uh, this past year. But it's a great place to come and practice, and I'd love to give uh, anyone that would like to come by a chance to improve their game. There you go. Tim, thank you so much for taking time out of your night to come and be a part of the show. I hope you'll come back and join me again sometime. I had a great time talking with you. Chris, anytime. Love to help you out, and you've got a great uh, a great show here. And have a great talk with Mark Carnival. Tell Mark Carnival that I used to drive by James Madison University from Rochester, New York, to Pinehurst when I would go there to uh, to work, and I would drive. It was right on the side of the highway, and I always remember seeing that school. Uh, it was a cool thing that you were talking about his uh, his college career. He's a great he's a great announcer as well. Yes, he is. Well, Tim, again, thank you for your time this evening. All the best to you and your family. I look forward to the opportunity, hopefully, to catch up with you again real soon. Thanks, Chris. My pleasure. Have a great night. Uh, you too, Tim. That's Tim Cusick, and again, his site is Tim Cusick Golf, and the, the, his last name is spelled C-U-S-I-C-K. So TimCusickGolf.com, a lot of great videos on there, folks, all kinds of different tips, and, uh, and you know, you, again, you can find it on YouTube as well, but uh, really great stuff, and what a wonderful teacher, and hopefully we get the privilege of having Tim come back on the show uh, again here real soon. All right, before I get to my next guest, Mark Carnival, I want to give a shout-out to a few of our sponsors. First, folks, you've heard me talking about Club Hub Sensors over the last few months, and it is the best portable shot tracking and swing analysis golf device out on the market because other shot trackers tell you what happened. Club Hub tells you what happened and why. You can take the progress that you're making over on the practice tee directly to your rounds with the only device of its kind that can go on the course with you. I have Club Hub sensors on all of my clubs. They screw right into the tops of your grips. And I can tell you, since I put the Club Hub sensors on my clubs, I've learned more about my swing and all of the data surrounding it than I've learned over the 40 years I've been playing the game. Because not only do you get GPS distances to the hazards and to the green, but after the round, you can look back at the images and the layout of every hole of the course that you just played and see exactly where and how far you hit every shot. No other GPS tool on the market captures that and lets you go back and review your round the way the Club Hub app does. It's available for Android or iPhones, and the app keeps track of your swing speed of every club in your bag, your tempo, your angle of attack, plus a 3D view of your swing as well. And no other rangefinder can do all of that for you. Go over to clubhubgolf.com to order your set of Club Hub sensors today and enter the coupon code NEXT to get 10% off on all products. Again, clubhubgolf.com, enter the coupon code NEXT, and you're going to get the best GPS and swing analysis tool on the market for a great low price, and you're going to see your game in a whole new way. I also want to remind you about our friends over at Par Bar. Energy and focus on the course is essential, whether you're playing you know, out on tour, your, your club championship, or just your weekend four ball with your buddies. Par Bar, the golfer's nutritional bar, can help you with both. Eat some before you get to the first tee and the rest every three holes until it's finished, and you're going to play with more energy and focus to win. Par Bar was developed by a lifelong golfer and a food scientist to help all golfers play their best. Go online to parbargolf.com and order yours today. This segment of the show is brought to you by the PGA Tour Superstore. 
see why golfers everywhere are proud to call PGA Tour Superstore their golf pro shop. Visit them online at pgasuperstore.com. Now, back to you, Chris. Now joining me on the French Lake Resort guest line is Mark Carnival. Let me remind you about Mark's background. He's from Annapolis, Maryland. Played his college golf at James Madison University, where he was a four-year letterman and a two-time team MVP. While he was there, Mark won the 1979 Governor's Classic and the 1982 James Madison University Invitational. He graduated with his degree in marketing and minored in economics. In 1999, he was inducted into the JMU Athletics Hall of Fame. He turned pro in 1983, and he won four times out on tour. At the 1984 Virginia Open, the 1990 Utah Open, the 1992 Chattanooga Classic, and the 1997 Nike Inland Classic. He got into a six-way playoff at the 1994 Byron Nelson Classic, everybody losing to Neil Lancaster, who was the only one to birdie the first playoff hole. But that tournament took place in some of the worst weather conditions perhaps the tour has ever seen, which we'll talk with Mark about here in a few minutes. Mark was named in the PGA Tour Rookie of the Year in 1992. He finished tied for 25th at the 1998 U.S. Open at the Olympic Club in San Francisco, but he was one shot off the lead after a first-round 67. That was the year Lee Jensen came back from seven strokes with 15 holes to play and beat Payne Stewart. You can now hear Mark on Sirius XM's PGA Tour Radio and PGA Tour Live, and I am honored that he is with me tonight here on Next on the Tee. Hey, Mark, thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure, Chris. How are you doing tonight? I'm fantastic. How about you, Mark? How are things going for you? I'm on my way down to uh, Palm Beach, stopped in Melbourne to see some friends of mine. So I'll be down there uh, this week working for PJ Tour Live. So looking uh, looking forward to that. So another week's work. There you go. Mark, I, I want to start our time tonight by going back to when you were a kid. You grew up in a very athletic family. Like I mentioned in your intro, your father was the head basketball coach at the University of North Carolina in the mid-40s and then over at the U.S. Naval Academy from 46 to 66. He's a member of the Basketball Hall of Fame. Talk about your dad and growing up in a very basketball family. Yeah, it was interesting. I'm the youngest of five kids. So the oldest uh, is my sister. So all three of my brothers played college basketball, uh, one at the uh, University of South Carolina for Frank McGuire. One played at University of Delaware. The other one actually went, it was before me, at James Madison uh, University. But uh, it was interesting. I was born in 1960, and then my father retired from coaching in, in 1966, and he went on to be athletic director at NYU and then at William & Mary uh, before he, at the College of William & Mary before he retired. But it was interesting. I love basketball, but uh, – as I was growing up, uh, I was, uh, my memory is like, I was about four or five years old. My dad was a, a really good golfer. He was probably about a four handicap. And I would go out with him, uh, and he would take me out uh, when he would go play or practice, or whatever. And I'd go out with him, and I, I got an interest in it, even though I still love basketball. And then when he, he kind of retired, when he retired from coaching, uh, and you know, all my older brothers were into basketball already, and they were doing it, and I was playing some, but. Uh, you know, he, he bought me my first set of clubs when I was uh, six years old. And then it kind of just blossomed from there. And there was, uh, as I said, even though I love basketball, it, it just seemed like it created a connect connection between my father and I because, you know, once a coach, you're always a coach. And uh, I can remember my mother talking about how my mo- he, she didn't like my father going to my brother's games because he would be coaching from the stands. And that, that just, <laughs> that's not why I didn't play, but, we, we created a, a very, very close friendship through golf. Uh, he introduced it to me. Uh, we played a lot of golf together when I was young. Uh, and it just, uh, it was, I, I, I don't know why I gravitated to it because, you know, as I said, you know, he was a basketball coach. It was more of a team sport, but it was just something I fell in love with. And I, I really owe everything to him for, for showing me and taking the time to, to introduce the game to me. And, and Mark, I mean, obviously you, you grew into such a wonderful player. And uh, as I was sort of looking through a lot of your history, you, you, you played in high school, Lafayette High School. You got into their Hall of Fame. And then I, when I was looking at the Hall of Fame class, you got inducted into you know, your high school <laughs> Hall of Fame with Lawrence Taylor, Ron Springs, Mel Gray. That's a heck of a, a yeah. Hall of Fame class to go in with. <laughs> 
Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, it was pretty exciting. Um, obviously, I knew uh, Mel Gray was younger than I was, but I knew both Ron Springs and and Lawrence Taylor. Lawrence Taylor was was a year older uh, than than I was. As a matter of fact, I remember one year, uh, and it was a strike season. I can't remember which year it was in the NFL. We were playing a pickup basketball game in Blow Gymnasium on the College of Wayne Mary. <laughs> And I, I remember Lawrence, get, he was a good basketball player, too, besides being a football player. And I remember him, like, getting the, the ball at the top of the key, and I happened to be standing in the lane, and I just remember just stepping out of his way. It's like there was no way I was going to get in front of him. Uh, but, yeah, it was, we had, a, we had a, a, you know, some pretty good athletes come out of there, and, and certainly uh, those three were outstanding. And, you know, I just happened to, to gravitate to another sport, and uh, it, was, it was pretty cool growing up. Uh, uh, in Williamsburg. And Mark, you, you go from Lafayette High School to James Madison, but I got to, you know, you were such an accomplished high school player. I have to imagine there were a lot of schools vying for your attention. Why James Madison? <laughs> well, it, it was, it was very interesting. I really wanted to go to the university of North Carolina and you know, where my dad coached, but for whatever reason, the coach there, and I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus, but uh, people could figure it out if they wanted to. <laughs> just really didn't have an interest in, and I just wanted to try out. I wasn't looking for a scholarship or anything. Matter of fact, Dean Smith, who was a dear friend of my father, said, look, Mark comes to school there. You know, we'll find him a job with the basketball program to, you know, cause I've been at a state student going to the university of North Carolina. It was back then it would have been fairly expensive, uh, even, even for anybody. But I, you know, I just said, look, no, I didn't want to. They, they were JMU recruited me. I'd talked to, uh, Georgia Tech. I talked to the University of Miami, and I just felt like, you know, I, I'm going to go to a school that I really like, and the fact that I would be able to play golf there uh, was just kind of like icing on the cake. And uh, I had a lot of friends who were going to school there. Uh, there was a history there with my brother, and it just, uh, it's, it, it just kind of happened. And I really almost had every intention of going there and transferring, but. I enjoyed it so much, and this is one of the things I tell parents and even kids when they're getting ready. I mean, I played every collegiate event in my four years. I think maybe I've missed one. I think I missed one event in four years, and, you know, golf, unlike other sports, it's about playing and getting that experience, and it doesn't matter whether you went to the University of Oklahoma or you went to Oklahoma State or you went to JMU. Uh, there's no, you're not going to get drafted because you play golf at JMU. You're going to play, you're going to, you're going to make it to the PGA tour and, or the web.com tour or, or the European PGA tour because you become a good player. And the only way to become, become a good player is by playing a lot of events. And in retrospect, uh, it, it worked out beautifully for me. Uh, I won a couple times in college, had some other chances, but it, it was really a great experience. And, and even when I graduated, I had no intention really of playing professional golf. Uh, it was great for the four years and I was going to move on to something else. And, and uh, about a year and a half later, I realized, you know, I really love this game and I'm going to give it a shot. And, and Mark, 2009, <laughs> you go back and you're in, now you're inducted into the college, your college hall of fame. So now you're in mm -hmm. you're back to back, right? You're in the high school hall yeah. of fame, you're in your college hall of fame. What's it like to stand in front of your college alma mater and get inducted into their athletics hall of fame? Well, it was pretty special because uh, one of the things after my father retired uh, from the college of William Mary, he became a consultant to JMU and a gentleman by the name of Dr. Carey, Ron Carrier, who really is one of the you know, key people that has elevated JMU to, to the school they're at. Obviously their people have come since his retirement, but there was a gentleman there also by the name of who was the athletic director, Dean Ehlers, uh, Luke Campanelli was a friend of my father's who was the basketball coach who I happened to be inducted with uh, as well there. Uh, it was pretty special. I mean, you don't, it's, I think when it happened and I went through it, it, it probably didn't hit me for a year or two uh, and, and knowing how important it was. And, and it was something I, I totally did not expect at all. And it was just, you know, I, I feel like at least, you know, I've, I've, I've drawn attention to that school, and now they've played in the FCS championship game back-to-back -back years, winning it a year ago, and then unfortunately this year losing the, to North Dakota State. But um, 
I feel like I've brought some attention to it. As far as I know, I'm still the only player to play and graduate from JMU that's ever played the PGA Tour. So uh, it's it feels pretty special. And Mark, as I was looking over some of your, some of your victories out on tour, you you win the 1992 Chattanooga Classic. You did so by coming back from 20th place, five strokes off the lead in the final round. And I read a story that your caddy, Leroy Schultz, who had previously caddied for guys like Lanny Watkins and Tom Weisskopf, mm -hmm. went over and told your friends who were, I guess, walking along the second fairway that you were going to win that day. What do you remember yeah. about that final round and why Leroy was so confident you'd win? Um, I, you know, I don't remember much. I, I was, you know, they, they being in the zone and, you know, I had two three putts on that final round too. I had uh, eight birdies and an eagle and, and shot 64, but I had two three putts as well. and missed a couple other short ones. Of course, golfers always tell you they could have been better, but I, I, I just, I never even thought about it. I didn't, I probably didn't feel any pressure until I had a, I think I had about an eight footer for birdie on the last hole, which I missed. Uh, I, I just think cause it was spot on. I mean, my driving was great. My iron play was great. Uh, other than a couple of three putts, uh, it just looked like, again, I, there was no question I was in a zone. It just kind of happened. I, I didn't wake up that morning thinking, okay, I'm going to go out and win this golf tournament. Uh, I just wanted to go out and play my best. And uh, I think I started off, I think I either birdied the first hole and then eagled the second hole. And, you know, by the time I got to the back nine, you know, I was either tied for the lead or was close to it. And, I, and even then I didn't think about it. And it was just, it's one of those moments that, and, you know, I guess maybe unless you're someone like Tiger Woods or Phil Mickelson, who's won, you know, a, a lot of times uh, that, that golfers very rarely get into. And it was, it was, it was surreal. It, it really was surreal. And I just, one of the funniest things I remember about the whole day done like two, two hours beforehand. And I'm sitting around, I didn't know what to do. And, you know, I, I started drinking a beer, <laughs> you know, I had a couple of beers. I don't, I don't, I don't even know what I was thinking about. And I remember, uh, there was a, there was a gentleman, Jim Simpson, who, it was it was it was on local TV. It was like on Comcast Sports South. It wasn't on part of the the PGA Tour uh, TV deal. It was on, it was on a local regional station. Jim Simpson was the host. Uh, uh, oh, there was a teacher that, that used to teach Ricky Barnes that I can't remember. I I, I know his name, but I can't think of it. Uh, Woody Blackburn was on the was one of their announcers. Uh, Donna Capone was. And I remember I'm sitting, and I have the tape of the of, of the final round, and I'm on the back of the green, and I had to wait for Ed Doherty. If he hold out his shot uh, from the fairway, and it was a par five, and he was probably 220 yards away, then he would have tied me. And I remember the, the camera, he hits the shot, he doesn't make it. The camera catches me finishing off a Bud Light. And I remember Jim <laughs> <laughs> kind of laughing about it. Well, the people back in Williamsburg, Virginia, were like that because there's a, a big Anheuser Busch brewery there. But it was uh, it was funny because I remember I, I don't remember what I did other than that between the time I finished and then when you know I ultimately won the tournament. That wouldn't have been that wouldn't have gone over very well now. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> As I mentioned in your intro, you were a part of a six-way playoff at the 94 Byron Nelson Classic, which was you know, played in some pretty mm -hmm. nasty weather. What do you remember about trying to make your way around that golf course in the rain and in those nasty conditions? Well, I just remember it kept getting pushed off from one day, you know, Thursday, you know, we're getting ready to play Thursday and we don't play. We're getting ready to play Friday and we don't play. And, of course, it had been raining earlier through the week. And so finally, you know, that's they actually added – uh, uh, cottonwood. So they figured, well, the only way they're going to get 36 holes in is if the, the golf course right across the street from uh, TPC Las Colinas, uh, they, 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 were gonna, they decided to implement that. And so I played there the first day. And then the second day, we, I played on the Las Colinas court, the TPC course. And the biggest thing I remember is I made the same putt I missed in the playoff on the 36th hole to get into the playoff. And I missed the exact same putt. 
on the first hole of the playoffs. And, uh, you know, Neil Lancaster was, was a good friend and obviously I hated to, to lose the playoff, but, uh, it was just, it kind of, it was the longest week I think I've ever, I've ever experienced just because it was the, you know, we'd go to the golf course and we'd sit there and we'd try and say, okay, we're going to try to play. And we just never, never could play. And it, it was a mess. It, it was, you know, it was just an unusual situation. I'm trying to remember. Uh, I know that I, I can't remember the players that were in the playoff other than Neil, <laughs> which, which is kind of bad, I think, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it was fun. And of course, you know, in retrospect, you know, it, I would have liked to have got that second win. Uh, it didn't happen, you know, on the PGA tour, but you know, I, I, I've, I've, since I've gotten out of playing competitively and I've done some other things, you know, I'm okay with that. And uh, it, it stands the way it is. And would I have liked to have won more? Absolutely. Do I feel like I could have won more? Sure. But, you know, I, I one of the things that I did when I, when I even started to, to play golf professionally was, you know, I never did it for the money. I, I did it because I love the competition. I did it because I, I wanted people to think, that, you know, there's a guy that really gets the game and understand what it's about. And, you know, the money was great. And, you know, I, I made enough, you know, to, to maybe not retire, but I made enough where I, I'm comfortable. And uh, it, it's, it, it's funny because that's one of the reasons why I chose uh, to stop playing. And, and uh, I, I think it was 2002 it was really 2002, early 2003 was like the last, my last real competitive rounds on the tour. I played a few here and there, but it just became in person. It came, it came too business-like for me. Um, I always felt like maybe I would have, <laughs> had I been born 40 years earlier and I could have played with Hagen and Sarazen and, you know, it was, it was entertainment to me in the sense of people were coming out to watch you and I wanted to give them a good show. And I felt like uh, that's what I did every time I played. And, it wasn't about me that the game was that much bigger uh, than I was. And if I could have one person walk away from the tournament each week and say, there's a good guy, he gets it. I like the way he, he approaches it. I like the way he handles himself. Then I felt like I was a winner every time I played. Mark, now you're by far one of the best broad broadcasters in any sport doing anything. What was it like for you? <laughs> kind of making that transition from one side of the microphone to the other well it was i mean it was interesting i was and actually i had this conversation uh I, I i had an opportunity and it wasn't in golf but it was in broadcasting when i was in high school growing up uh at, when my dad was at the college of wayne and mary uh during the winter months in between you know the christmas break and when the students you know William mary would play games at William mary hall and i remember I was 16 years old and Columbia University was coming into play and they had a, they had a, a radio announcer and somehow there was a connection with my father and, and we got talking. They said, Hey, you want to be the color person for, for the basketball game? I'm like, sure. You know, cause obviously I knew all the Wayne Murray guys and I kind of learned the Columbia guys and it, it was kind of fun. And when I was in college uh, at my fraternity, I was kind of like the DJ Um so there was always – I always felt like I could connect with people and listeners by either what I said or if I played music or whatever. And then when I got out of when – I, when I decided to quit playing, uh, I really wanted to work for the PGA Tour. And I had some dear friends who worked for the tour, and they said, you know, go out, you know, try to be a tournament director, uh, you know, at, at some event and get some experience there. So I, I became a tur tournament director, which back then would have been the – the buy.com tour, you know, pre web coming in. And, uh, I, I was there for a couple of years in Virginia beach. And then I was a tournament director to, excuse me, a champions tour event in Hickory, North Carolina. And then I came back and talked to former commissioner commission, uh, Fincham. And for whatever reason, you know, nothing was there. You know, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but I felt like I would add value to whatever it was I did just because of my experiences, both as a player and as a tournament director on the sponsor side, on the player side, but it just didn't work out. And a friend of mine, uh, and I actually had done some broadcasting TV 
I did some for Golf Channel in the late 1990s. Uh, I, I did two events for ESPN in 2001. And I just felt very comfortable with it. And I, and I had uh, I had some advice from a gentleman by the name of Keith Hirschland, uh, who was a former producer for Golf Channel and ABC. And he said, Great you know, just talk show. about what you see. Yeah, just talk about what you see. Uh, you know, we, you're here because of your experience. So relate what you see to the viewer or the listener. And that was a, that was a great, what I think is a great lesson. I mean, I think there are a lot of announcers that, you know, they throw stats out there and all, and I, and I, look, that, that, I, I have no problem with that. Um, but I, I believe listeners and viewers want a sense of why does a player do that or, or why did that, why ultimately did that, did he hit that kind of shot or what, what is he thinking about or what is he, you know, what is he trying to do here? And to me, I, I just, I want, you know, I want them to, to get And with radio. Obviously it's much more difficult than TV because we don't have any pictures. So we, we have to paint that. And, you know, I, I always, it, it always, I always find it interesting because if, if you're a listener, okay. And, and I'm calling a golf shot. You're looking at a hole from tee to green, right? You know, I'm, I'm hoping that's the way you're looking at it because I think listeners can imagine themselves playing that hole. So when I'm up on the green or I'm saying it, I try to convey it from the perspective of that listener playing the hole because you'll hear people say, okay, he's punting it. You know, he misses it to the right, but he actually misses it to the left because they're standing behind the green, they're calling it the way they see it. I'm trying to call it the way I think the listener sees it from that perspective so that they can understand it and, and get a better sense of it. And I find it, it, I chuckle. And again, it's not, there's not a right or wrong way, but it's something that I've adapted. But I, I just think that, you know, being able to bring a listener, you know, it's like they, they make the old comparison of, uh, of baseball and, and the great announcers in baseball being able to, uh, you know, just, just paint the picture of the game. And that's, that's what I, that's what I, you know, I think I do a pretty good job. I don't know. Um, uh, I'm assuming I do because I'm still working. <laughs> so, uh, I would, uh, I would hope that if I wasn't good, I wouldn't be working in the sense that, uh, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's being able to, to, for, to, to be able to, uh, bring the, the right sense of excitement. You know, it's, you know, not every shot is a great shot. A lot of shots are good shots, but when it is a great shot, you got to bring that excitement. And, and I think that, I think I've developed, a, 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 I don't know, I, I wouldn't call it a philosophy, but uh, I think it, it's, it comes very easy, easy for me in the sense that I go back to what Keith Hurston said, Talk about what you see. Nothing else. You don't need to talk about anything else. It's interesting that you, that you mentioned that, and, and Keith is fantastic. I, I've had the privilege of, of having Keith on the show a few times and, and looking forward to getting him back on here in, in, in the next couple of weeks. But um, it's interesting you talk about no pictures and painting things because, Mark, as, as, when we turn the calendar to a new year, many people like me start immediately looking forward to the Masters in Augusta mm -hmm. National. And Augusta National is my favorite place on the planet. Talk about what it's like being a part of the broadcast team because now you're trying to paint the picture of what Augusta National is like <laughs> and what it feels like to be at the Masters. Talk about that. that that's, you know, that's, that might be one of the most difficult things because TV doesn't even do Augusta National justice, as you probably know. Uh, it, it is so different than what, you know, obviously it's beautiful and, and everything, but the, the elevation at, at Augusta National is, is so much yes. more dramatic that if you've never, if you've never been there, you would never know. Um, and the interesting part about, uh, the Masters is that no, no announcers are allowed inside the ropes. So we are in, um, for the last, I think three years, uh, they actually they have Char we have Charlie Reimer, Bob Papa, uh, Brian Katrick, uh, Maureen Medill from uh, the European Tour uh, is there with us. And for the so I, basically I go out when we go on air and we go on air about two o'clock, and I go to the behind the green at the uh, par five eight, and back in the very last row there's a 
there's a section of about four plexiglass little booths. And, you know, you've got the Japanese companies there. You've got BBC. You've got Sky TV there. And, again, no one can walk, no one can walk inside the ropes. Uh, so you, you, I will sit there, and then I'll, you know, I'll call all, all the groups coming through, and then eventually I'll go to 17. But they, they use me as kind of a second analyst. Charlie Reimer uh, is in the 18 uh, position with Bob Papa. Uh, it, it is – because the crowd, the crowd dictates so much of, I think, the broadcast uh, with their, you know, the way the way they respect the players, the way, you know, there's no running at Augusta National, just just kind of the whole atmosphere, and it, there is almost like this constant build up to a crescendo, uh, particularly on on Sunday when the when the final groups are coming through there, but. Uh, it, it's a privilege to be able to, to work for Westwood One uh, and, and call the Masters. Uh, you know, I, I, I sit there like a lot, and I've been very fortunate throughout my my life, you know, mostly due to my dad. You know, I've been to like 12 Final Fours. I've been to a Super Bowl. I've been to the World Series. Uh, I've been to the NBA Finals. I've been a lot of things. And to be able to, obviously, only to be able to play there was was outside of this outside of the world you know without without explanation probably one of the most unbelievable experiences i've ever had in my life and now to be able to broadcast from there and to help and and in some way uh golf fans and i think people that follow this game are, are the greatest fans of any sport because i think you know granted we all have there are there are a few maybe a little crazies out there but in general and I think a large part, uh, golf fans are maybe the most respective fans of any sport I've, I've ever seen. And because it's probably the one sport that they can participate in, you know, maybe tennis might be the other one, but it's the one sport they can get the closest to either their idols or to the greatest that have ever played the game. And for those who can't get there, uh, I, I think it's a privilege to be able to bring it to him. Mark, just a, a couple more before we let you go, and, and you mentioned the word, the crazies. And we've heard some players like Justin Thomas talking about the crowds now, right, starting to maybe get a little out of hand with all the shouting, particularly on the tee boxes. Mm-hmm. And some of it, you know, you know, is not only obnoxious, but it's starting to become a little mean-spirited. We saw a little of that a couple of years ago at the Ryder Cup. You're right there. You're walking – you know, the course most yeah. of the time inside the ropes. Is it getting out of control? I mean, I think there are certain instances, yes. Um, you know, I mean, golf events are big money makers, And, you know, we'd be, we'd be, <laughs> you know, we'd be deaf, dumb, and blind to think that tournaments don't make a lot of money off selling alcohol. And I, hey, I love a beer. I love a glass of wine. I love, I love a vodka on the rocks. Um, but it becomes... I think particularly with the Ryder Cup, it becomes a competitive thing. And between – see, to me, I, I go back to, to something I said earlier, and I think I said it. You know, it's a game that we play for a living, right? I've been privileged to play a game for a living. And, yes, there's a lot more money in it now, and and, people, and players are making a lot more off the golf course. And it should be entertainment. And – I don't know why. I think you have it in most sports. There are there are rowdy fans. I think they're few and far between. Um, I, I don't know the instances, other than people shouting on the tee. Uh, you know where this is. You know where where a lot of it is coming from. You know it's to just deal with it. If, if someone gets out of line, you just you escort them off the property. Um, I, I think what I, what I would not want to see is the 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 game the PGA Tour whatever the USGA the PGA of America or the European PGA Tour take that to the extent where it alienates the fans because without the fans there is no game there is no there are no tournaments they they might think they might be able to do something but without fans there aren't and unfortunately you, you, you're going to get a little both so I, I, well I think there are certain circumstances that are uncalled for um i think in general 
it, it's I'd say they're, they're pretty good. But I, I mean, I, you know, I, I guess, you know, I'm not playing for $2 million or $8 million every week now. So maybe I might have a different opinion, but I, I don't think so. <laughs> Mark, before we let you go, let our listeners know, how can they stay up to date with all the things you're doing, whether it's online, on air, or over social media? Well, they can they can follow me on Twitter at, at McRoy at, at M C R O Y ninety two. Uh my website is still up for my radio show, although I'm not longer doing my radio show. That's the Mark Carnivale Show dot com. And it usually has my schedule events that I'm working. Uh but normally on Twitter every week I'll I'll post something that says uh, I know I posted when I was going to LA. I think I posted when I was at the waste management. I'll post something tomorrow. Uh, that'll be, of course, you can find me on Sirius XM, PJ Tour Radio, Sirius 208, or XM92. Obviously not every week. Uh, you won't find me this week. But you can also find me on PJ Tour Live on PJTour.com. Um, I got I to gotta do a better job of that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark, it has been a huge thrill having you as part of the show. Very sincere when I say you're you're one of the best broadcasters in any sport over any media that there is. I really enjoy your work. I think you're fantastic. I hope you'll come back and share more of your stories and insights with me again sometime because this has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for your time. It would be my pleasure, Chris, and I got plenty more stories. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you, Mark. Take care. All the best to you and your family. I look forward to catching up with you again soon. Thanks a lot. Take care. See you, Mark. That's Mark Carnival. And uh, folks, again, you can find him on uh, uh, Sirius XM. He's over there on the PGA Tour channel periodically and uh, over on PGA Tour Live. And uh, you go back, and one of, the, one of the fun things about doing this show is the, is the opportunity to go back and do the research you know, on, uh, on my guests and, and see, you know, the great tournaments that they, that they were a part of, the great tournament wins that they got to have and the experiences there, whether if it's an instructor, some of the people that they've got to work with and their philosophies and, and all of those sorts of things. But when you get the opportunity to go back and look at a Mark Carnival and, uh, and the great uh, career he had, you know, you go all the way back to high school. Again, he's in the Hall of Fame for his high school and for his college. I mean, think about that. How great is that to be recognized by both of your alma maters and being in, in their athletics hall of fame and, and to see the, you know, the great success he had at, at, at JMU and then going out and being a, you know, a part of the, the PGA tour and, and winning a couple of times there, winning a couple of state championships, the Virginia open and the Utah open. And, uh, and then, you know, a rookie of the year, 1992 and that sort of thing. And uh, boy, what a, what a thrill it was to hear, you know, the stories. And I love, you know, the enthusiasm in Mark's vo voice and, and the way he shared the stories. And then, you know, next time, hopefully we get to have him back on soon hear more of the stories from when he was on tour and uh, some of the stories now as a broadcaster and again if if you've heard him if you've heard him on the radio you know what I'm talking about when I say you know what a great job he does so uh, he makes the tournaments infinitely better because he's a part of them and uh, he talked about painting the picture well painting the picture he does very very well and uh, like I say that's that's everything when you're when you're doing it on the radio because you've got to you know we got to be able to see it through his eyes and uh, no one does it better than Mark Carnival does. All right, folks, it is time for me to put a bow on this episode of Next on the T. But be, uh, before we close up shop, you know how we like to remind you about the great things that Jim Estes is doing and uh, the folks, his team, over at the Salute Military Golf Association. Let's hear a word about that from Jim. The Salute Military Golf Association was created to provide rehabilitative golf experiences to the brave men and women who have been wounded while serving our country. Hi, I'm Jim Estes, PGA Golf Pro and co-founder of the Salute Military Golf Association. With my adaptive golf program, we've successfully helped thousands of soldiers in their recovery, both mentally and physically. The SMGA has been providing family-inclusive golf experiences across the country since 2007. To date, the SMGA has equipped more than 1,000 warriors with properly fitted golf clubs and has extended its clinic series to more than eight chapter and affiliate locations across the U.S. If you are a wounded veteran interested in participating or if you'd like to learn more about the Salute Military Golf Association and find a chapter closest to you, visit our website at smga.org. We've seen firsthand how impactful golf can be in aiding one's recovery. The Salute Military Golf Association, empowering wounded veterans one fairway at a time. Visit smga.org. That's smga.org. 
Yes, indeed, folks. They are doing some amazing things at the Salute Military Golf Association. To find out more information and to see how you can get involved, go online to smga.org. All right, folks, it is time for me to put a bow on this episode. My sincere thanks again to Tim Cusick and Mark Carnival for joining me tonight. I hope you all enjoyed the show. Please give me your thoughts. Check out our page on Facebook, Next on the Tee with Chris Mascaro. Give us a comment. Give us a like. Those are all very, very important to us. Plus, if you have a question for one of our future guests, let me know. Go on Facebook and, and post your question there. Be glad to get it on the show for you, whether it's for an upcoming guest or, or someone who's already been on the show. We'll get that question over to them and get the answer for you. Please check out our newly designed uh, webpage at nextonthetea.net. That's where you can see who some of our future guests are going to be. Please also check out our sister show on the football side, Thursday Night Tailgate, with me and my co-host Bob Lazari and our announcer Joe LaGianusa. That show airs live every Thursday night from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time. You can stream it live on Blog Talk Radio. That show, like this one, also available as a free podcast over on iHeartRadio and Podbean as well. On Thursday Night Tailgate, we are joined every week by five NFL legends who come on and share their stories from their playing days, share their insights into what's going on around the NFL. We do that show year-round. Plus, we also highlight two players doing great things in their communities every week in our Spotlight on the Positive uh, segment. You can find that show online at ThursdayNightTailgate.com, and again, the show next on the T.net. Folks, thanks again for choosing to listen to this show tonight. We know you've got a lot of podcasts and a lot of radio shows you have the opportunity to listen to. We really appreciate the fact that you're making Next on the T one of them. Until next week, hit them straight, my friends. You've been listening to Next on the T with Chris Mascaro, where PGA and LPGA pros and top instructors and media members go to tell their stories. Join us the same time every Tuesday to hear more stories about the game we love from people who love sharing those stories with you. It's all about the great game of golf. It's all about the great game of golf.